Today, I'm thrilled to welcome author and historian extraordinaire Sarah Gristwood to speak with us about her book, Tutors in Love, and some of the other marvelous things she's been working on. Welcome, everyone, and a huge thank you and welcome to Sarah Gristwood, one of my favorite historians. I'm surrounded right now by her books. I've piled up around me oh. and authors and just so someone I'm delighted to bring on and chat about uh, her latest book, now available finally in the U.S., and some of the other things she's worked on. So welcome, Sarah, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Now, I always like to ask historians, what was it that got mm. you interested in history. So can you share with us some of your early memories mm -hmm. of thinking history might be something you'd like to learn more about? Well, I guess it, it it's so far back in the mists of time, I can hardly remember. But you see, I grew up in, in Kent, in England, of course, but in Kent, uh, where I'm speaking to you now, you know, not far from, I, I was born outside Dover, think Dover Castle, think all the history, that mm. scene. My first school was mm -hmm. just on the slope below it. So really, if you've got that sort of history presence in your life, a lot of it is there already. You know, I remember, oh, Canterbury was where one went in the holidays, you know, or to get your school uniforms. Or you might say to a friend, oh, yes, let's go to Canterbury. And, you know, what we'd be doing is, heaven knows what, buying lips, trying lipsticks or something. But you might say, <laughs> I'll meet you by the tomb of the Black Prince. You know? So it was kind oh, wow. of there yeah. already. And particularly in Kent, I guess, Tudor and earlier history. I mean... Dover Castle, of course, you know, goes right the way through from early medieval times, you know, right through to uh, a role, a role in the Cold War even. But there's mm -hmm. also Hever Castle is in Kent. Knoll Park is in Kent. It's just around you all the time. So um, I, can, I can imagine, I think being able to say to someone, I'll meet you at the tomb of the Black Prince is just fascinating. <laughs> that, what, what, a way to, <laughs> what a way to meet someone. I know. Um, all right. So as, as that's all around you, what really mm. sort of took you in different directions or different areas, different people in history? Well, I guess, I mean, the interest never went away. And in a sense again, in the UK or in England, more specifically, even than, you know, than Great Britain. If you're interested in history, the Tudors does tend to be your first port of call. Um, when I was growing up, it would have been all over the TV. I mean, you know, Six Wives of Henry VIII. In fact, I don't think I've shared this before. My godmother actually wrote one of those episodes, the Anne of Cleves one. Then Glenda Jackson, you know, in Elizabeth R. And cu curiously enough, coincidentally or otherwise, at both the schools I went to, you know, as a, a what we call here a secondary school pupil, you know, 11 to 18, uh, the Tudors were being taught as, you know, the main part of the, of the curriculum, rightly or wrongly. So really, it always was the Tudors. Nonetheless, my own working path took me in different directions. Um, I read English rather than history at Oxford, though that's turned out to be, you know, really, in some ways, as relevant. Um... And then I kind of, you know, ran away to join the circus, as it were, and became a journalist for for a number of years. But the passion for history never went away. My my first book, Arbella, my first historical biography, rather, Arbella, England's Lost Queen, was born 
well, almost by chance, but of course I was looking for a subject and I hit on an irresistible one. I was actually just on the way back from a, a wedding in the north, driving down our M1, thinky motorway, thinking where mm-hmm. could I stop, you know, to have some lunch, have a break, and realised that Hardwick Hall, as in Bess of Hardwick, was just off the motorway, so close indeed, that if you take your eyes off the traffic for a, you know, illegitimate moment, uh, you actually see it up on the hill above you. And I promise I didn't. I looked at it on the map beforehand, okay? But when I went there, I I found my story. I mean, at first, what appealed to me there was this sense of four great women through the Tudor age whose stories seemed to hover around Hartwick. There was Bess of Hardwick, the the famous matriarch who built it. There was her granddaughter, Arbella. There was Mary, Queen of Scots, who'd been, you know, held Bess and her husband had been the custodians of Mary, Queen of Scots for some years. And even though actually Mary never went to Hardwick, they've still got what they call a, you know, suite of Mary, Queen Mary rooms. And Queen Elizabeth, Bess of Hardwick's friend and sovereign. And at first it was that kind of diamond shape of the four that interested me. But increasingly I came to realise that Arbella, Bess's granddaughter, Mary's niece and Elizabeth's possible successor, who was the real tale. She was the one whose tale had not been told recently. And there I was, you know, for better or worse, I was up, up and away. Oh, it's a wonderful answer because one of the things I love about Arbella, about your book, is that it brought to light someone whose story, even in Mm. Elizabeth's reign, really doesn't get told. So Mm. we get the sense somehow toward the end that it was just always going to be James. The throne was always going to go to James. And that wasn't the case. And we lose Arbella. She just has sort of disappeared yeah. somehow. Yes, I agree. And that's exactly what interested me. Partly it may be, you know, the writing of women out of history. Partly it is that history is, you know, history is written by the, by the victors, by the winners, by James's team, as it were. Because mm-hmm. it, it's a kind of interesting object lesson in just how things how how history can be quite un uh, you know really unconsciously rewritten so that we see elizabeth being succeeded by james as a wholly natural progression and we forget that there were whole years a decade of elizabeth's reign when foreign ambassadors were writing home that you know quote it is Elizabeth, it's sorry, it is Arbella they would proclaim queen if Elizabeth were now to die. And even Elizabeth was telling an ambassador's wife, you know, look to Arbella well, one day she will be even as I am. And yet that had got forgotten completely. I loved having that brought to light and seeing it as that this was a real possibility and it's not quite as tidy as we think sometimes. I think that's, we've sort of tidied up history in some ways. That's a very good way of putting it. I think that's exactly what does happen, that we're taught, or children's books even, when I was growing up, there was the Ladybird series, you know, that preach a kind of very Mm. conventional, and then, and then, and then, and -and so-and-so was succeeded by so-and-so, as if there'd never been other possibilities. But of course, what fact, one thing that I'm very much aware of is the figures then, the people in history didn't didn't know they were history, as it were, you know? Right. To them, it's what was happening then, it was politics. With all the messy deals, you know, the sort of uh, half-hearted alliances, mm-hmm. the compromises, that politics breeds. 
And that's all about uncertainty and negotiation and not being able to to know the future. We know the hindsight, right. the past, but not the future. And as they're making those messy deals, they're often covering their tracks or attempting to. Mm. And so we don't see Indeed. the ones that fall apart all the time. Um, we see the tidied up ones that worked. Let's move into some of the most recent book. And I just, we could just talk about all of them, but um, with Tutors in Love, which is just wonderful, you had already explored one Tudor love story with Elizabeth and Lester. So did that inspire you to do more or was this project born out of something else? Talk to us a little bit about this Tudor love story I, interest. Hmm. I think it was probably born out of something else. Um, I guess maybe the book before this one gate was called Game of Queens, the, the women who made 16th right. century Europe. And as part of that, as looking at some of the you know some of the powerful women or even the less powerful ones you know who were were instrumental in the 16th century i right i i came across well i explored a little more the stories not only of henry the eighth's you know most famous wives catherine of aragon and anne boleyn but also the stories mm -hmm. of his sisters margaret Tudor and who married the King of Scots and Mary Tudor, who of course was married off to the King of France and then made a love match of her own. And maybe it was then that I began to see a common thread running through it. I think I came to see the Tudors as a dynasty in love with the idea of love at a time when, of course, that's not what ro what royals were supposed to marry for you know even aristocrat you were supposed mm. to make a be, have a marriage made for you for the good of your family or your country and then hopefully you know you'd come to fight to find affection with your your partner but the tudors seemed to be sort of dancing to a different drummer i became more and more interested in that now simultaneously without me even knowing the words the the idea of courtly love this this concept that i see as key to unlocking the tudor dynasty had also been in my head you see i'd argue it's actually in all our heads without us even realizing it or knowing the words i mean the prime example in this country in the uk was oh a, 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 a tv ad for a box of cadbury's milk tray but since i'm assuming you didn't have the same ad in the states i you know won't go into that but half, half you know half the literature since tudor times and half the pop songs today, without them even mm -hmm. realising it, they echo, they reference this romantic idea of love that when the Tudors came along, it had been around for centuries, a very specific code. But perhaps the Tudors were the last ones to take it quite so seriously and to use it quite so consciously. That is fascinating because I'm thinking knight in shining armor and all of that. Precisely. So how, mm. how so if we, if we start with the first mm. Tudor marriage with Henry the seventh and Elizabeth of York, yes, which yes. was probably in some ways the most traditional because that was a political marriage. It was. But it, yes, it, it seems was. to have turned into something more as time went on. They did seem to yes. develop an affection for each other. Yeah, that one is interesting because, as you say, when their marriage was arranged, you know, they hadn't really met, even met. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, and as you say, it did turn into a kind of affection. So, But all the same, one would think of Henry VII as being, you know, perhaps the least romantic monarch in, you know, in history. That, that's how we think of him. But that's not mm -hmm. altogether right. Even he... Um, 
uh, quite consciously and you no doubt cynically but deliberately made use of the Arthurian mythology the mythology of King Arthur's Camelot with which the idea of courtly love had become absolutely intertwined I mean before the battle of, of course he'd, he, he would have grown up on those stories first in Wales and then in, Brit in Brittany and before the Battle of Bosworth, he adopted as his standard the Red Dragon Dreadful, uh, which Red Dragon of Wales, of course. But guess what? The same year as the Battle of Bosworth, finally, Caxton printed his English translation of the death of Arthur, you know, the, mor the mor Mort d'Arthur. Mm. And mm -hmm. he described how King Arthur had a dream in which the dragon, red dragon, beat down a tyrant boar. The boar, of course, the symbol of Richard III. Henry VII oh, yes. made sure that his and Elizabeth's firstborn son would be called Arthur, born at Winchester, which Mallory had identified as Camelot. And I think one can safely guess that Elizabeth of York would, you know, Henry VII's wife, would happily have gone along with this because she, we know that she'd grown up on these stories. There's her signature, Elizabeth, the king's daughter, or, you know, on books of Arthurian myth in, in the Royal Library. And of course, her parents, um, Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville, there'd been a huge romantic story of their marriage, their meeting, which is absolutely mm -hmm. full of the courtly love patterns. But it was with Henry VIII and his siblings that it really kicked off the, the romantic side of the, the chivalrics. And one of the things you point out that I, it always gives me a little chuckle, but I think he really believed it, that Henry VIII would style himself as Sir Loyal yeah. Heart. And, you know, you yeah. look at his life and think, hmm, but... It seems to me he did see himself that way, <laughs> or at least he wanted to. Totally. I think Henry, the, I, I do think that Henry VIII was someone who was very much concerned with looking well, looking good in the eyes of the world, but also in his own, in his own eyes. And I think courtly love, this ideal of love was very much, very important there. So for the first years of his marriage, when he rode as Sir Loyalheart, loyal to his watching wife, Catherine of Aragon, you know, with her initial mm -hmm. embroidered, embroidered on the, you know, his horse's trappings, um, he sort of saw that love as within marriage. But he wrote a song, didn't he? I love true where I did marry. But historically, mm -hmm. Back from its birth in the 12th century and with the stories of King Arthur and Guinevere and Lancelot, it had been in many ways a kind of adulterous code. It had been all about how what was important was the ardour and passion and strength which equaled purity of your feelings, even if that was between a man like Lancelot, and a woman like Guinevere, who was married to somebody else. And I think that when Henry VIII, for a variety of reasons, began to look beyond Catherine of Aragon, I think it was absolutely the courtly code that enabled him to see, to cast, his love for Anne Boleyn as something worthy, something virtuous, you know, not as a rather shameful, dirty okay. trick played on his loyal wife. The whole idea of the courtly code had been that the man, the lover, sort of gained morally from this strength of feeling he had for, for the lady. So I think, you know, Henry, with his obsession with with being right, if you like, with being in the right, mm -hmm. that this really was helpful to him. You know, that he felt he was, he could tell himself, tell everyone else, 
that he was kind of learning from from this this passion for Anne. And of course, as we know, she was leading him uh, in religious direction, in direction of religious reform. So that, again, really played into it. If we just think of that story and sort of play it through, it seems like mm. before they were married was the maybe the most powerful part of his feelings for her. It yeah. seemed to dissipate yes. pretty quickly after they were married. Do you think that's part of the well, courtly love yeah. that it was more? Yes. Yes, I actually do. Because courtly love originally had been all about uh, non-marital affection. You know, back in the 1170s, where it was kind of codified at the the court of Marie de Champagne, you know, Eleanor of Aquitaine's daughter, by by her first marriage mm-hmm. to the King of France, um, where she first commanded, you know, the poet Chrétien de Troyes to write down the story of Lancelot and Guinevere. But, um, her, well, you know, it may have been her chaplain, uh, Andreas Capellanus, who actually wrote rules for, for, for courtly love. And he envisaged, mm. I mean, I'm sure this, we don't think this was actually, you know, real, really happened then, but he envisaged actual courts of love in which Mary and other ladies would adjudicate on the finer points. And one of the questions there was, is true love even possible within marriage? And Marie de- declared that no, it wasn't, you know, because because um, marriage is a matter of arrangement and, you know, true love comes from the heart. So I think although Henry VIII didn't mm. entirely, things had changed over, you know, more than three and more than three centuries. But nonetheless, I think Henry VIII did expect different things from a wife than from a courtly mistress. Whereas Anne, to some degree, went on playing that courtly game. And of course, although there's, I'm, I believe, many factors that contributed to making the kind of perfect storm that led to Anne Boleyn's downfall and execution, uh, the courtly code played a part there. Not only, you know, were all the kind of the, the the dialogues of which she she was accused, you know, talking with men like mm-hmm. Weston and Norris and even Smeaton, you know, about who mm-hmm. is it you really love? Why, madam, it's you, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, that's, you know, sort of standard courtly play. But also, if Cromwell, with his master Henry's connivance, no doubt, wanted to bring her down, the courtly code that actually promoted adulterous love has to have been a weapon in his hands. And okay. I mean, you can see even when, even once Anne, had, when Anne was on her way to the tower and, and in the tower, she's, oh, she's expressing the, the thought that perhaps her husband was just trying to test her. Pretty unlikely, but the test thing is an absolutely major trope of the courtly love story you know she was speculating that she might be allowed to retire to a nunnery and guinevere Mm. was sent to a nunnery or the flames oh so that does fit right in that's that's really interesting Mm. and that he expected something different from a wife and she was she didn't switch roles so much Let's look at their daughter then, Elizabeth, because Mm. you can see how she bakes courtly love sort of into how she Mm. runs her court. So can we talk about that a little Mm. bit? Tell us a little bit about Elizabeth and courtly love. Yes, she absolutely does. I mean, I think we have to start by remembering, although we now look back on both a staggeringly successful Elizabethan age, uh, and we look back on Elizabeth as the Virgin Queen, uh, that wasn't the way it looked to contemporaries at first. It's that old thing about history being, you know, fluid and messy again, more so than hindsight. Mm-hmm. When Elizabeth I came to the throne, 1558, uh, it was absolutely assumed for the first years 
by everyone, her courtiers, Europe, other European sovereigns, etc., that she would and had to marry, as her sister had. Um, because that was almost, that was really the only way anyone in England could think of how a female sovereignty might work. You know, although Mary, uh, Elizabeth's half-sister, had in many ways paved the way for her, Mary had married amid much discussion of whether then her husband was the king and the boss. So when mm -hmm. slowly it became apparent that Elizabeth wasn't going to marry, you know, the game went on, but slowly, slowly her ministers, her statesmen were forced to realise that, no, maybe she really wasn't going to do this, then somehow there had to be a kind of language. Because remember, she was the first, she was only really the second, you know, really, um, ruling queen in England and the first mm -hmm. unmarried. So, I mean, unless you count the nine days reign of Lady Jane Grey, um, and if, even indeed, even she was married. Um, right. And courtly love, when you look back at that extraordinary relationship between Elizabeth and her courtiers and favourites, um, courtly love fits the bill precisely. You've got all these men who were required basically to spend years, decades, down on one knee adoring Elizabeth. You know, met from Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester, Christopher Hatton, to later on men like Raleigh and Essex. And you kind of think, how on earth did they do it with, you know, without laughing behind their hand <laughs> the possible mind you mind you the later ones like Essex might have laughed a bit but the first generation didn't and that's it mm -hmm. courtly love makes their position adoring a woman for years who's never going to actually marry them or you know get very far with whom they're never going to get very far it makes it look mm -hmm. admirable rather than ridiculous. And at, in almost every way, the theoretical position of the courtly lady fits the position in which Elizabeth was cast as a reigning queen. I mean, if I can just run through them a bit, the courtly lady mm -hmm. was meant to, as we've said, um, give a kind of moral example to her lover. Well, you can't get much higher morally than the woman, the queen, who was supposed to take take the you know, head of the church, take the moral lead for the whole country. The courtly mm -hmm. lady was supposed to be of higher rank than her lover and able to dispense patronage. Well, you can't get, you know, no one had more to give than the queen. The courtly lady was mm -hmm. supposed already to be married to someone else. That's why she couldn't marry you, her lover. Well, Queen Elizabeth mm -hmm. figured herself as married to her country. And it just goes mm. on and on. Um, and you can see it in the letters, the language. Uh, it, it, it's re you know, it really it explains this pattern in a way that nothing else does. That's fascinating because she does keep them around for Hatton and Lester, for example, yeah. until they die, you know, um, and, yes. and they are so devoted. All right. Let me just ask one, one question because you said everyone thought she would marry her courtiers thought she would foreign leaders thought she would. Do you think she, ever plan to marry did she want to marry did it just not work or did she mean it early on when she said she would never marry i actually think she meant it um i think there is possibly a moment early in her reign when she might have been kind of you know bewitched 
bedazzled, bewildered into marrying Robert Dudley because she was in love with him. But of course, at that point, he was married or he was already married to somebody else. Later in her life, it's just possible that if all her ministers had combined on pushing one candidate, she wouldn't have been able to resist. But in fact, of course, she was able to divide and conquer because all her different ministers and courtiers wanted, you know, wanted her to marry different people. But I do think that she had... Uh, there, there, there were two sets of reasons why she shouldn't marry, after all. There may, I believe there was, have been a strong visceral, emotional, you know, feeling against marriage, uh, possibly triggered by um, her relationship, if that's the word for it, with Thomas Seymour, you know, when she was a girl, a princess, and the trouble that that caused his death, her possible disgrace. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you know, she'd seen her mother beheaded for reasons of love. Well, she had, you know, seen it, you know, she'd known her mother was beheaded for reasons of love. So many others among her stepmothers and wives of her leading courtiers had died, you know, for love or in childbirth. I think there's, she had every reason to be viscerally afraid of love, sex, childbirth. Um, and when she said, you know, she said once to an ambassador that, when she thought of marriage, it was as if something walked over her grave. That's a very emotional way to put it. But there were also strong political reasons. I mean, it had been seen in her sister Mary's reign, that huge question that was considered, you know, by Henry VIII, among others, to be one of the chief reasons a woman couldn't rule. It wasn't just mm -hmm. that they couldn't lead an army into battle, one or two had, after all. Um, but that when they married, it was considered when, not if, uh, then right. their husband would effect, would become the king, the boss. I mean, Elizabeth could have seen this north of the border with her kinswoman, Mary, Queen of Scots. When Mary married Lord Darnley, he absolutely assumed that he was then running the country, even if Mary, you know, mm -hmm. wasn't didn't want to have any of it. And it, it, it was always the fear that if the Queen of England married a foreign prince, then England would be subsumed to her husband's country's interests, possibly forced into their wars. And again, that had happened in Mary's reign. Right. England had right. gone into a war of Spain's, may, you know, gone into Spain's mm -hmm. war, basically. So there, there were strong right. political, whereas if, if, if Elizabeth had married, had married one of her subjects, married, let's say, Dudley, Leicester, um, well, the same questions would have been there as to who was the boss, but also there'd have been huge faction at court. Right. There were really no good options for her. No. Um, other than remaining yes. unmarried. Yeah. Which, and of course, right. I guess we have to ask whether or not she looked on that as a good option. I think she did. And who knows, perhaps the fact that she could have all the fun and the flirtation with mm -hmm. her fav her very handsome, tall, dark and handsome favourites. <laughs> courtly love helped right. out there too she didn't have to marry them right. she could have the everything else anyway she would have everything else and if one of them annoyed her she just turned to another and played them off each other which she right. seemed to yes. enjoy quite a bit mm -hmm. oh yes. that's that's a wonderful way to think about her approach to all of that and those who were successful at remaining in favor generally like Lester and Hatton played the game very mm. well with her yeah yes they did i think things got a bit more a bit more sour in mm -hmm. in the later latter years of elizabeth's reign i mean you can see can't you there's a very there's a sort of definite mark halfway through the 1580s sort of armada time when lester right. uh, moves out of the field and indeed even hatton is finding other interests 
I mean, Lester dies, you know, Hatton's moving into mm-hmm. his parliamentary career. And other men right. like the Earl of Essex coming in. But I don't think, I don't think that, I think they saw it as a game they had to play. I believe that men like Lester and Hatton did have a huge, genuine affection and respect for Elizabeth herself, love, as well as loving what she could give them. I'm not so sure about men like Essex. Perhaps we should spell out the Essex thing a little bit. Um, That he was Lester's uh, stepson, and I'd say in some ways surrogate. You know, Lester brought him to court to kind of in Mm -hmm. some ways do the, the, the suitor's job that Lester himself, you know, was no longer willing or able to do. But Essex, I mean, he, you know, many years younger than Elizabeth, he would write things like to her, to Elizabeth, that, you know, oh, when he was away, her windows were the, the poles, the lights that would guide his ships home. He wrote about conquering her resisting will which sounds almost sexual but I think the fact is that Lester was saying very different as as you've just suggested saying very different things behind Elizabeth's back to the things he was saying to her face he played the courtly game but I think to him he was playing a necessary if rather distasteful game Whereas for the, the, the men earlier in Elizabeth's reign, there'd been a real, real genuine emotional element to it. It's, it's fascinating to look at that through the lens of courtly love um, mm. throughout mm. her reign. Well, it, That's really interesting. Yeah. It, it, it does explain the kind of the relationship that, that the men were required to take in relation to Elizabeth as nothing else does. You know, there's that um, image, that picture from late in Elizabeth's reign, which seems to show her on a litter, you know, being borne aloft by her courtiers, almost like Mm -hmm. a goddess. And that's very much the kind of apogee of courtly love. There was also that element of um, gender confusion, if you like, that, you know, courtly love always seemed to cut theoretically cast the lady in this powerful position almost like you know as a man um and of course a reigning queen was also meant to be a woman in one sense but on another a male you know elizabeth described herself as Mm -hmm. a prince didn't she Mm. that worked very well for her because she Yes, she mm. described herself, you know, the heart and body of a king. I, I mean, the body of a weak and feeble yes. woman, but the heart and stomach of a king. That That's fits it. right into yeah. that. Mm. You have met, as you've moved through these different periods of time, and we've talked especially about the Tudors and all of the fascinating characters. Mm-hmm. If you were able somehow magically to wave a wand and have two or three people over for tea, Two or three of these historic oh. characters, just for a tea and chat. Wow. <laughs> Who would you like wow. to sit um, and chat with, do you think? Gosh. Well, you see, I think from the two most fascinating ones are the obvious, Anne Boleyn and Elizabeth I. But, you know, I'm not really sure tea and chat would have happened with either of them. <laughs> Um, I think Elizabeth would have been a much too tough. You know, she'd have expected you to be there on your knees serving the tea kind of thing. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Anne Boleyn, it, it's the classic answer, but she is. She's so fascinating partly because she is a bit of an enigma. You know, we don't actually have that much evidence to what she really was like as a person. And I think we'd all love to know what it was that was so compelling about her. Whether you would have got that from a tea, you know, sitting there as another woman at a tea party, I don't know. I just don't know. Um, I mean, Mm. for sheer pleasure, oh, for sheer pleasure, I think Christopher Hatton, but that would just be for a nice chat rather than, you know, rather than Mm -hmm. because I so passionately want to know about him. 
But one of the mm-hmm. ones for whom I have most admiration and who I think should be much, much better known in you know the English speaking world is Margaret of Austria, who, of course, did teach Anne Boleyn some of what she knows, what mm-hmm. she knew. Um, Margaret of Austria, the regent of Hungary, to whose court Anne Boleyn was sent as a very young girl. And Margaret, you know, one of the most powerful and effective women, you know, politicians in Europe. Right. Many of her contemporaries, Wolsey, Ferdinand of Aragon, all said so. But also someone who may well have taught Anne Boleyn, given her her first lessons in how to play and in the dangers of the game of courtly love. Well, that is a perfect sort of coming all the way around um, person to think about because she is someone that I think influenced the Tudor court through Mm. Anne Boleyn and through, you know, Mm. people like Charles V. You know, I mean, she really was more of a player and a political power than we give her credit for. I mean, sort of like Arbella, Mm. she gets written out, but that influence Mm -hmm. is very strong there. Mm. All right. Well, just before I let you go, um, as this year comes to a close, I just wanted to to mention and and get your thoughts quickly. Um, I was fortunate enough to visit the UK a couple of times in 2022, and I was there in February Mm -hmm. when everything was just ramping up for the Jubilee. And then I was there again in October just shortly after the queen's mm. passing and and the sadness was palpable. I mean it was such a change mm-hmm. for me coming in at these two different times. And so I, I just mm. wondered if you had anything that you could share about the impact of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and her passing. It just seems like it's a real mm. change. It just feels so different without her. If I'm sounding discombobulated as we speak now, it's because I've actually spent a morning talking about what Netflix just dropped this morning, Ah. which was the last three episodes of the Harry and Meghan podcast. Um, So, yes, it's very strange times for the British, British monarchy. I think immediately the accession of King Charles III went a lot better than we might have expected or feared. Um, I think he made it clear that he was very aware of the balancing act he had to tread between his mother's huge legacy Mm -hmm. and the need to modernise, the need to do things slightly differently, not least for a man to do things differently, you know, from a king, from a reigning queen. Mm-hmm. Of course, there are have been some hiccups along the way, um, and this Netflix series represents one of them. Too soon, perhaps, to be sure quite what the impact will be. As I say, they literally, as we speak, it literally dropped hours ago. Um, mm-hmm. But my 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 feeling is that actually, the monarchy is set on a better path for the 21st century than many might have feared. And, of course, that is the legacy that Queen Elizabeth II would have wanted above all for herself, for the monarchy to survive and thrive through the 21st century. Oh, that's a really nice way to think about her ultimate legacy is going on without her. Well, I think the yeah the royals are very pragmatic about that because it is so much about the succession one generation after the other. I think they're they're far more pragmatic than than many of us are because uh, I think for someone like Elizabeth II, the the chief thing is that the crown goes on. Well, thank you because I I know how. Um, much of an expert and and you're a someone people look to. So I appreciate your sharing that notion that, you know, her legacy is the continuation mm-hmm. and that as Charles mm-hmm. steps in, it it he does seem to recognize the need for some change and that she, in fact, 
was mm. is part of preparing for that. So, so thank you for that. And yes. thank you for spending this time with me and with us. This has been absolutely wonderful. And again, and I'll put all these links in the show notes, but um, for those of us in the U.S. who've been waiting a long time for Tutors in Love, although I have to admit, I just buy it for from British publishers, but I'm really excited to get my U.S. copy too. Um, and so thank you so very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Are you working on anything now that we can be looking forward to? Mm. Well, uh, right at the moment, I'm just finishing editing an anthology of women's diaries, which, of course, starts wow. in Tudor times, but goes right up to the present. But after that, yes, I think there probably will be an another Tudor story coming along the way. Oh, how wonderful. Well, that gives us all something to look forward to. And that diary sounds very interesting as well. But thank you so much for taking the time. I know it's a busy thank time, you. but thank you so much for being here and sharing these, well, all of your wonderful books and these ideas about history and how important it still is. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. I can't thank Sarah Gristwood enough for joining us. She's been one of my favorites for years, and it was such a treat to have her here. And thank you for listening. I really appreciate your support. Big shout out to the Royals, Rebels, and Romantics patrons. And I hope you all have a happy history holiday. <laughs>